Okay. Uh, today what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the homework that I assigned for your last lesson. Uh, last lesson we talked a little bit about how the aggregate demand and aggregate supply curves can move uh, and what that ends up meaning for the current status of your economy. And so what I thought I'd do is I'd go through the answers and just discuss sort of what you should have been doing. And you can check along as you go through. Um, hopefully you did get a chance to practice these before you, you view this. Um, the first question asks you what would happen if the average income of Canadians increases due to a booming world economy. Uh, it was done for you, but it shows you just the general sort of picture. Um, the key idea is that you would have started at full employment. Now, I should have really labeled that there, but here you should probably, just at the point where full uh, sort of the AS is increasing, you would want to label that full employment there and price level zero on this uh, axis. If you were to have a booming economy beyond full employment, then the potential, at least theoretically, is that you may actually go into a little bit of an overgrowth period. Uh, you would have some slight inflation. You can see that there uh, in terms of the higher price level. And then you would also have output beyond full employment. Uh, typically speaking, uh, unless it was a huge, huge boom, it probably wouldn't be a, a major, major risk. Um, but the one thing that the government would have to watch, and this graph does indicate that, is that you're starting to, as the economy booms beyond full employment, get into a little bit of an inflationary gap. And if you start to increase too, too much into that bubble type territory where there's not really a lot of real return and there's a lot of high prices, then you, you may want to kind of do things to keep growth, but maybe not overgrow and slow things a little bit down. Typically, this would be a picture that would uh, often call for something like, for example, a raise to the interest rates in the economy, which would slowly um, sort of pull the heat out, but not necessarily push you uh, sort of catapulting backwards into a recession. Um, the second picture asked what would happen if you cut back on spending out of fear that debt levels are rising too quickly. Uh, you can see the picture here. This would be the consequence. If you were at full employment and you decided to cut back on spending, uh, the challenge would be that while you're at full employment, the cuts in spending would probably pull money out of the economy, uh, both in terms of the government spending, but also in terms of the multiplier effect that comes from those dollars that were being pumped in. Uh, it wouldn't have a dramatic impact on inflation, uh, maybe a slight decrease. Uh, I should note that typically speaking, the aggregate supply curve is not a 100% elastic in this range. There is still a little bit of an increase. So you would pull the prices back a little bit, but not very much. Uh, inflation would probably be a little lower, but very, very little. Uh, the key challenge, though, is that cutting spending when you don't have lots of room to do that, it may actually push you back into a recession. Uh, that has happened in the past. Um, sometimes governments have been in positions where they feel very confident because they have a lot of money and they may cut back on spending a little bit too quickly. They may not be in a situation where they're really, uh, that's ideal. Uh, and they may end up creating a bit of a double dip where in an earlier recession that had been ended, is reintroduced by the cutbacks. And again, you have to be kind of cautious. Um, the third one looks at energy costs. And so you can see that here in this graph. Uh, energy costs declining rapidly would have an impact for Canadian manufacturers. Uh, the key idea is that uh, when you're talking about energy costs, that's a factor input. And so when you decrease the price, it actually improves the ability of the economy to produce uh, on the supply level. And so the key um, change that you would want to put on the graph would be a decline in your sort of, uh, sorry, an increase in your aggregate supply curve. But you'll note it's an increase in your aggregate supply curve that doesn't change the capacity because you still have the same amount of energy. It's just cheaper. And so while it would yield lower prices, which is natural, lower prices of energy means lower sort of um, spillover costs for, costs for consumers because the things that they are being made are cheaper to make, uh, it would also mean um, a little bit more output. And that's actually a consequence, again, of things being cheaper, people can afford more, so they will buy a little bit more. Now, one thing that's missing from this picture, and you could argue, uh, is that energy costs are obviously for Canada also an aggregate demand factor. Um, the theory probably uh, would have been fine just doing the graph the way we did um, the theoretical answer but technically speaking for canada you could have also argued an aggregate demand pullback uh in that obviously if energy prices go down certain regions alberta saskatchewan um, and to a lesser extent, Newfoundland standing out the most. Uh, that's one of the most important resources they produce. And so a lot of the output uh, would obviously be pulled out of the economy that way. So that's something that you could have made an argument for. Uh, I don't know if we're ever going to get to a test, but if we did, I probably would have accepted an aggregate demand decrease uh, for those reasons. Just 
due to the important nature of energy for Canada from the production standpoint. Uh, question number D asks you what would happen if the government in Canada reduced income tax by 10% for low-income Canadians? Um, the impact there would be an increase in aggregate demand. And the reason for that is that if you decrease people's tax, um, then that would essentially mean that they have more money that they can spend. Now, how much that increase occurs probably depends on whose particular taxes you increase uh, or decrease. Typically speaking, we talk about something called the marginal propensity to consume. It's not equal for all citizens. And so government would have to be very careful in terms of lowering tax to make sure that those people whose taxes were being reduced would have a high incentive to spend that money. But in a general sense, while we don't know exactly how much aggregate demand would increase, it would tend to increase. And then, of course, the impact would be that you would have higher output and maybe because you're already at full employment, perhaps a little bit of inflation. Probably not really a necessary thing to do in a period of boom. Um, it's possible it could happen, but the challenge would be that if you're already booming, you may not want to sort of create more stimulus uh, just in that you don't need it. Um, the next question is the Bank of Canada decides to lower interest rates. Again, uh, in this particular picture, lower interest rates would mean more encouragement to spend money, um, and typically that would mean more consumption, uh, more business spending, and an increase in aggregate demand. Uh, the end result of that particular policy would be to have, if you started at full employment inflation and higher output. But probably not something that would happen. Uh, Bank of Canada lowers interest rates when you're down here with your demand, not when you're already at full employment. Um, they, they in particular uh, have very minimal gains to be made by trying to increase uh, spending, which is always kind of risky spending when it's spending uh, from, from uh, pe people borrowing uh, in a period where the economy doesn't really require it. So this lower interest rate policy would push aggregate demand to the right. Uh, it's far more common when you have a recession than it would be in, in the scenario above. Um, question F asks you what would happen if you had a rise in productivity. This is that magic bullet sort of supply side economic growth that economists uh, for years have often sought out. And certainly it's been pushed for in various policy ways by governments over the years. Uh, if you could get a real raise in productivity by encouraging you know, thoughtful, intelligent investments, maybe better education, uh, then the impact would be that price levels would lower because you have more potential output. Um, and you also, because you're producing more, would see that uh, the um, GDP would increase. Now, it wouldn't necessarily create a um, inflationary gap, though, because essentially what's happening is that your new full employment scenario has now actually um, become further outwards. Your economy has more potential for growth, and so full employment occurs at a higher level of GDP than it had before. Um, probably a great um, sort of um, benefit for an economy if you have this happen. Uh, the challenge from the policy perspective is that while you can invest it and try to make it happen over time, this is a slow, slow move. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. You're probably looking at 10, 15, 20 years worth of good, thoughtful um, investments and decisions that lead for that growth to occur at a steady rate. Um, the price of lumber, one of Canada's prime exports, doubles on the world market. How would that impact things? Uh, only consider the impact on ex exports. Uh, well, if the price of lumber doubles and Canada exports a lot of uh, lumber, then obviously it would mean we'd have more money coming in because people would still need the lumber. They would still need Canadian lumber. They'd just pay more for it because that's a going world thing. And so assuming it's a world increase in price, then you would have an increase in aggregate demand, uh, an increase because you're already at full employment of your prices, and then uh, an increase of the output as well. Um, maybe not the most necessary policy at that time. You'd have to be careful to see that it doesn't create too much inflation, but nevertheless something that could occur. Um, the last question asks you, why is the shift in the aggregate supply curve to the right, like an outward shift in the PPC? I covered that uh, a couple of uh, days ago when we were talking about just the overall nature of things. Um, the key idea is that if you recall your PPC, the graph where you would have two goods uh, in an economy and it shows how much you can make assuming you use it in all your resources, well, if you have more resources or more productivity, then it means the boundaries of that curve increase. Uh, similarly, if you go back and we can show this graph, right here, if you increase the amount of resources or your productivity, then it essentially means you have more potential for output before you hit your limits. And so it's really dealing with the same thing. The only difference, of course, is that when you're looking at aggregate supply compared to a normal sort of PPF, 
uh, you're dealing with a situation where you're not just considering a, a very restricted too good economy, which is what you did with the PPF model at the start of the year, but a more realistic uh, picture of an economy where, where there's really unlimited numbers of potential goods. Um, the last question says, imagine the economy is in the middle of recession. What problems is the economy likely to be facing and how might the government fix that? Well, I think the problems with a recession are obvious and I put them down here. You have high unemployment, you have low GDP. And so your goal would be to try to take that underperforming economy, which you can see there, and push the aggregate demand curve to the right through government policy to try to reduce the unemployment, increase the GDP. How could you do that? Well, there's a number of ways. Um, one of them is that you can lower taxes to boost consumption and investment. I'm just going to zoom out a little bit so you can see this a little bit better as a whole. Um, you also uh, could lower interest rates. So the bank may decide to lower interest rates to try to increase the growth that direction. Um, and then finally, and this is pretty common, the government may pour its own money in uh, to the economy to get things going. All of those things are currently happening with the current coronavirus uh, crisis. Government has lowered, uh, or through the bank's uh, interest rates, uh, government has talked about stimulus measures to get money into the economy now, particularly for people who need it, businesses, individuals, so on and so forth. Um, you're going to hear more and more about that over the weeks to come. Um, but clearly that is a current policy goal and will be probably for at least the next, I would guess, year or so. Okay, thank you.